Grace, peace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God our Father and from our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For anyone new, I want to explain we're going over this parable, sometimes just one word at a time. All scripture is inspired by God, so all means all. This time we're going to look at the word path. As he sowed the seed, some fell along the path that was trampled underfoot. The birds of the air devoured it. Now, when I plant corn or peas or beans, I make little rows and I plant each seed one at a time, giving each seed careful attention. Now, on the other hand, planting wheat or grass is an entirely different situation. You, cast, you broadcast it out there, some places too much, some places too little, and some places where you don't even want it to be. We simply cannot control that many seeds. You think a handful of wheat has what? Two or three hundred seeds? Grass, maybe a thousand. So you have no control over that much. That is what a parable is about. The sower went out there, he had a bag under here, and he threw out the seeds one at a time, and some fell along the pathway. Now, what is a path? A path is that part of the property where we go over it and over it and over it, walking, 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 and it gets packed down and packed down and becomes hard. And you don't fertilize it, you don't try to seed it, there's no way anything can grow on that. Now, let's bring this into our own life. What are our paths? Another word for a path for us is the word habit. What do we do over and over again until it becomes ingrained in us and we do it without thinking? Some of the things we do over and over and over again are good. Some of them are not so good. When I came home from the army being stationed in Germany, I did not go to church in Germany very often except to a Catholic church now and again on special holidays. We had a small barracks. There was only one chaplain and he was not of my faith. And although the town was Lutheran, German Lutherans at that time were anti-American. I was not welcome there, so I didn't go. But when I came back, I said to my mother, going to church is a habit. And I'm going to start by going the very first Sunday I came home. And so I did. Now, let's think about some of our own members, maybe even you. Something happens and you miss church. You got sick. You couldn't come. The next week, you went on vacation. Two weeks, came home. Third week, you needed to rest up because the vacation was kind of hard on you. So now you've missed a month. Next week, a business. Next week, something else happened. You had to miss church. Another Sunday, another Sunday, and, there's, and the elders or the pastor comes out and say, hey, We've missed you. What's wrong? Well, now, wait a minute. Now, the first Sunday, I was sick. The second Sunday, third Sunday, I was gone. The fourth Sunday, something came. And, well, I guess I just got out of the habit. I just got out of the habit. Worship, prayers, Bible reading, visiting your family, shut-ins at regular intervals is a habit. It's a good habit. Sometimes habits are sinful. There are different ways of looking at these habits, weakness, propensity, call it whatever you will. They're sins. And Satan encourages us and says, go ahead. And many times, in your case, it doesn't matter because of blank, blank, blank. Now, we do it over and over again, and pretty soon, you know, not so bad. It's not really a sin. Satan has won the victory. But there's another pathway. It's the resistance to change because we've always done it this way and we're not about to change. I think of our own church in Missouri City. We started out as German immigrants coming here. We formed a German community. We had our services in German. And pretty soon more Germans migrated. We, we became at one time 27% of all Americans were either first born or second born Germans. And then we welcomed these new immigrants into our Missouri Synod Church. We were like St. Paul said, be all things to all men. 
So we use the German language, the German culture, and our churches grew by leaps and bounds. As an example, my grandmother came over here in the late 1870s. She died in the late 1920s, 50 years. She never spoke English, never. Now, my father was born over here. He lived in a German home where they spoke German. His neighbors were all German. The stores were all German. The school was all German. The church was all German. He went to a parochial school through the eighth grade in German, and all of a sudden he's in the ninth grade in a public school, and he had never spoken English. He must have been 14, 15 years old before he started speaking English, him, an American citizen. Well and good, but times change. People moved out of their German communities and other kinds of people moved in. But in the German churches, they said, well, wait a minute. We're supposed to be German, and so we're going to con continue our services in the German language. O outsiders don't tell us what to do. As late as the 1970s, I had a call to Chicago to a German church with a Hispanic neighborhood. I turned it down. I faced a similar situation in my vicarage, my year of internship at a very large church in Detroit. The pastor who was running the show had been there for 17 years. And every time I made a suggestion, he would say, you know what, you don't have any experience. I do. I've been here 17 years. I know what works. I had learned all kinds of new tricks in the seminary how to make the church function better. Let me give you an example. Sick calls. He had, he had I don't know how many. He'd start Detroit. He'd start here, go there. There, 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 and then he'd be through back there. Next day, here, 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 different people. Next day, I said, you know what? Why don't we get all these people in one day? All the Listen, I've got 17 years of experience. I don't need you to tell me what to do. Finally, toward the end of my year there, I said, I want to tell you something. You don't have 17 years of experience. You have one year repeated 17 times. Uh, I was not always a nice person like I am now. <laughs> Sometimes I still am the same way as most of you know. And that's where these two verses can help us. Come, let us reason together, and there is wisdom in the counsel of many. There might just be a better way to sow the seed of the gospel. Pathways are both good and bad, and how and why we use them. How about this verse? Jesus said to them, I am the way, another word for path, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then this one, thy word is a light unto my feet and a light unto my path. You can't go wrong with those two. Here's another thought. It seems reasonable that we should not scatter seeds on the path. There's a wide study, it was in the 70s and 80s, I don't know where it is today, but they had scientific rules on how a church functions the best, how it grows. And they said there is something called a homogeneous group. In English, birds of a feather flock together. So they said, don't waste your time on people who will not really fit into your congregation. Now that is socially true. Birds of a feather do flock it together, but it's anti-biblical because we're supposed to go into the whole world and preach the gospel to everyone. I have experienced the least likely people became some of my best members. What in California, there was a man who controlled the Frito-Lay in that area. And I was told by his brother-in-law, stay away from him. He fights with pastors. He doesn't get along with them. Visit his wife, my member, when he's not there. Well, I visited, and he was there. And we had a beautiful con con uh, conversation. He took instructions. He joined the church, became one of my best members. Another il illustration, I may have shared this with you before. A couple came from Sacramento, and on the way out, the woman said, I really love your church. I, I want to join you. 
I said, what do you mean I? She pointed to him. He said, I'm an atheist. Long story short, he became one of our pastors. Spreading the gospel where we should, not when people tell us, but where the Spirit leads us. Now, it is true that in certain denominations, you find a lot of like-minded people. Episcopals tend to be wealthy and well-educated. Pentecostals are less educated and less wealthy. But however, if somebody comes into our church and they don't feel at home, we've done our business and they can find out where they really fit in. Our mission is not really to grow the church, but to grow the kingdom. Now that might seem counterproductive. Hey, wait a minute. I was told this way back in, in California. They said, we appreciate all these new people you're bringing in, but can't you get somebody who's not on welfare? <laughs> it's not up to us to decide who comes into our church. If they don't like it, they'll find something, but we've done our share. It's not up to us to grow the church. It's up to us to cast the seeds. It's up to us. It's up to the Holy Spirit to give us the increase. So, number one, think about some of your habits, your bad habits. Uh, do you gossip? Do you worry too much? Are you lazy? Are you taking good care of your health? And a hundred other things. Maybe you ought to change some of those things. Get off that path. And then, the other hand, don't feel bad because you cast the seed out and you didn't see the result. It's your job to share the gospel. It's your job to invite people. It's the Holy Spirit to do the rest. That's not your job. It's his. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.